Well, we are coming to the conclusion. Today is the last part of our series that we've been calling Unlikely Leaders. And we've been looking at various stories in the Bible of people who God used to change their their world in ways that we're still talking about today. And these were unlikely people, people that you would not expect God to use in such impactful ways. And, And when Pastor Edwin and I planned this series, it was our prayer that we would have some folks amongst us who would be inspired by these stories, inspired by these leaders whom God used as unlikely as it seemed, to change their world. And that we'd have people who would say, you know what? If they did it, I could do it. If God used them, God could use me. If, if a need was in their world, a need is certainly in our world. And we were hoping that we would start to see even more people, unlikely leaders, rising up. Because our world needs nothing more right now than leaders who are cut from the mold of these leaders that we've been studying. A beauty queen named Esther who realized that her privilege, that her prosperity was not for her sake alone but was to be leveraged for the voiceless and the vulnerable. And through her leadership, through her influence, she not only saved her nation, but she preserved the line of Jesus. A child king who made a decision early in his life to swim upstream against culture and to pursue God with everything that he was. And he ended up leading an entire nation back to faithfulness in God and saved an entire generation from judgment. The weakest man of the weakest tribe, a guy named Gideon, who God puts his finger on and says, yeah, you're the guy I'm going to use to lead a small band of soldiers against a massive army to demonstrate to my people that I am sufficient and I can do anything. A marginalized woman who is transformed through an encounter with Jesus. And through her story of brokenness being made whole, she is able to lead an entire city into transformation, and a young, impulsive, self-centered man named John was influenced by his proximity to Jesus, and and through his witnessing of the cross, he realized that the purpose of leadership, the purpose of power and authority is not for my own sake or for my own interests, but is in humility to be leveraged in the interest of others. Through all these stories, we have learned that that God can do anything. He is all-powerful. We have learned that God could do anything through anyone. He could use anyone. We have learned that God is actively involved in our lives and in our world on a daily basis. And that he typically chooses to work through people to accomplish his purposes. And all that is needed is someone who is willing to say, here I am, use me. Someone who is willing to have a a bit of faith that God can do what he promised to do. And God is able to work through unlikely people in order to impact their worlds in powerful ways. And today we conclude by looking at the story of, of one more unlikely leader. And this, this leader is incredibly unlikely, but for reasons that you may not see right at first. And, and again, we would hope that there would be some unlikely leaders in our midst today who would learn from this leader and be inspired to change their world as he did. He, he was born around the same time as, as Jesus into a devout Jewish family in Tarsus. On the eighth day, according to the law of God, they took him to be circumcised and they gave him his name. They gave him a Jewish name, probably a family name. They called him Saul, which also would be called Paul if he was around Gentiles. But this guy would never be around Gentiles because his father was from the strictest sect of the Jews. He was a Pharisee. Well, Tarsus was known at the time to be a prosperous city of commerce. And so not only was it a wealthy city, but it was also uh, a city of education. They had the, the, the most prosperous, most prestigious uh, university known in the Roman Empire at the world. And so this young Saul, growing up, because of his family influence and because of the city in which he lived, he would have had access to the best education in the Roman Empire. And from an early age, this young man showed himself to be ambitious and sharp. He was a high-capacity boy. If he put his mind to something... He could do it. Always the sharpest mind, always the first with the answer, always the top of his class. And when Saul was still young, it was determined that he would become a rabbi as he grew up, which was basically a minister, a teacher, and a lawyer all wrapped up into one. But according to the Jewish culture, before he would enter into his formal training, he would have to learn a skill, a job trade. And so around the age of 10, he was put in as an apprentice of a tent maker. It was one of the most popular uh, crafts, skills in Tarsus, but he would learn how to make tents out of goat hair cloth. This would serve him well uh, later in his life. But at the age of 13, 
because of his aptitude, because he was a high-capacity young man, because of the, 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 the education he already had and the strings that his family were able to pull, he was sent to the best school in Jerusalem to study under the celebrated rabbi, Gamaliel. Well, there, young Saul would have been educated in the Old Testament scriptures. He would have memorized the first five books of the Bible, the Torah. He would have memorized large portions of the Psalms and the prophets. He would be exposed to ancient literature, to ethics, to philosophy. He would also learn the, the question and answer form of debate, which was very common in the ancient world, something called diatribe. And again, a skill that would serve him very well later in his life. But after six years of formal, in-depth training, Saul graduated around the age of 19 or 20 years old, and he became a rabbi. He became involved in the religious and legal workings of the Jewish nation. And again, as a rabbi, he showed competence. He showed ambition. He was one of the sharpest minds, one of the best debaters. He stayed late at the office. He was pegged as one who would very early in his life become a part of the Sanhedrin, of the Jewish ruling council, the highest court made up of 71 Jewish men who would oversee Jewish law, Jewish life, and Jewish religion. And we're not sure if he went back to Tarsus right after graduating from school or if he stayed in Jerusalem after his schooling. We know he ended up back in Jerusalem. He very uh, possibly had exposure to Jesus during his three and a half years of ministry perhaps even interacted with Jesus as one of the Pharisees who was interacting with Jesus as recorded in the Gospels. We know that he was well acquainted with the life and the teachings of Jesus, of the, the trial and the execution of Jesus, of the later rumors that Jesus had been resurrected after three days in the grave. We know he was well acquainted with this new sect that was rising up as a result of Jesus' life, the Nazarenes or the followers of Jesus of Nazareth, those who had come to be called the Christians. And he would have watched as the Christians began to slowly gain traction in the city of Jerusalem, as they slowly gained converts. He would have heard the reports of, of miracles that were being performed by these followers of Jesus, stories of healings. He would have been in on the trial of Peter. He would have heard about the miracle of Peter being set free from prison in the middle of the night, even though he was guarded by 16 soldiers. He would have heard the stories even of those being raised from the dead by these followers of Jesus. And the more traction the followers of Jesus uh, gained in the city of Jerusalem, the more polarized the Jewish leaders became about what to do about them. Some, like his own teacher Gamaliel, argued for patience and tolerance. He argued that if they are of God, then you will just be fighting against God, but if they are not of God, then nothing will come of them and they will fizzle like every other movement has. But others were arguing that even one Devout Jew led away, and heresy and untruth was a tragedy. And so we need to do whatever we can to stop this movement using whatever force we need. And Paul, or Saul, while he was very loyal to his rabbi Gamaliel, he found himself more and more siding with those who believed that the, the Christian sect should be stamped out, no matter what it took. And then came the breaking moment. One of the leaders of the Christian sect, a man named Stephen seemed to win every debate about the resurrection of Jesus. He continually made the Jewish leaders look foolish by pointing to their own scriptures, proving that Jesus was indeed the Messiah. And that seemed to, to just agitate the Jewish leaders even more. His logic, they couldn't argue with it. He continually poked holes in their own arguments. And finally, some Jews had come from other parts of the, the empire, and they began to debate with Stephen, thinking, well, we could take this guy on. But again, Stephen made their arguments seem foolish. And these men felt humiliated, and they, they were just determined to get even with Stephen. So they found some scoundrels, some guys who would give false report about Stephen, saying that, that he was speaking out against the law of Moses, a crime that was punishable by death. And these men came forward, and they accused this this wise leader, godly man, Stephen, of this crime. And he's brought before the Jewish ruling council, the Sanhedrin. And these scoundrels make their accusations against Stephen. And Stephen is given an opportunity to speak in his own defense. And as he sees it, this, this jury is rigged, that there is no way he's going to be acquitted. 
he lays into the Jewish leaders and he tells them that they not only killed the Son of God, the Messiah, but they killed him the same way they killed every righteous person that God ever sent to them. And the Jewish ruling council, they're furious. They cover their ears. They can't listen to this blasphemy. They tear their clothes. They gnash their teeth. And they drag Stephen from the court. They drag him outside the city. And there, with brutal force, they execute this man of God by stoning him. And there is Saul witnessing it, approving of it. And there as he witnesses the death of this righteous man, something happens in his heart, something that sets the course of his life. He realizes this is his calling, to stand for God and stamp out this movement. And so immediately, the Bible says, he begins to lead out in a persecution of all Christians in Jerusalem. And as with everything Paul has ever set his hand to, he is very good at it. He is successful. He is ambitious. He is driven. He is so successful in his persecution of Christians in Jerusalem as he goes into homes and he raids worship services and he takes men and women and children prisoner, forcing them to deny their beliefs or be imprisoned and in some cases to be killed. He's so successful that Christians begin to flee Jerusalem. And this even further infuriates Paul and enrages him because now not only are Christians getting away, but now they're taking their lies and their heresies to other places. And he's even more committed than ever that he's going to stamp this movement out. He will get every one of them if it takes him his last breath. Saul continues to breathe out murderous threats against the followers of Jesus. He resolved to find them, to crush them wherever they are, and he heard that several of them had taken up refuge in Damascus. Damascus was about 130 miles north of Jerusalem, and they didn't have cars. This would be a good six, seven-day walk for Paul to get there, but he was determined to get every Christian. And so he got the necessary papers from the high priest to be able to bring back any Christians who he found and imprison them, to kill any who wouldn't comply. He secured the necessary um, detachment of guards and all the chains and swords that he would need to accomplish his task. And he began the long journey to Damascus. Saul was a high-capacity man on a mission for God. He was zealous. He was devout. He was committed. He was convicted that he was doing the right thing, that he was pleasing the heart of God. But Saul was heading in absolutely the wrong direction. Now, if we were to stop the story right there, based on what you know about Saul, up to this point in the story, is this a guy that you would figure would become like the foremost leader of the Christian church in the first century? I mean, is this a guy that you would think would end up writing over half of the New Testament, the, the books that we still study, the letters that we still study today? Is this a guy that you would think would become the foremost teacher of Christianity in the first century or the greatest teacher of the gospel in history? Is this a, a man that you would think would end up giving his very life willingly because of his conviction that Jesus of Nazareth was the long-awaited Messiah. Highly unlikely, right? But this is what makes Saul of Tarsus an unlikely leader. So what happened? Well, as Saul and his men, his, his, his sold, the soldiers with him, are nearing the town of Damascus, after their long journey, God had plans to confront Saul, to convict him, to convert him. He was going to change a man who he knew would go on to change the world. And as they journeyed about midday, the Bible says, suddenly a bright light shone all around them, and Saul falls to his knees, and he hears a voice coming from out of the light, and the voice asks him a question. Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. And the answer to this question is going to completely destroy it the foundation of Saul's life and change the direction of his life and really the direction of the world. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Now get up and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. Just imagine, as he hears those words, I am Jesus, what happens in Saul's mind? What thoughts come? What feelings flood his heart? How does he feel? What are the emotions? Shock? Horror? 
confusion, terror, fear? Questions, certainly. He had been fighting against God, not for God. It just floods him in a moment. He, he had been heading in the wrong direction, fighting for the wrong cause, giving his life to the wrong thing. And in just a second, every foundation in Saul's life just crumbles. And he realizes, everything I stand for is wrong. The foundation of my life is gone. And I had to, he had to wonder, what is God going to do with me? Well, the men who were with him, they, 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 they saw what was happening. They heard the voice, but they, they didn't know where it was coming from. And so after the light goes away, they, they help Saul up. They quickly realize that he's blind. So they lead him by the hand the last uh, short distance into Damascus. And for the next three days, Saul is there. He's blind. He doesn't eat anything. He doesn't drink anything. He just broods. He just must be thinking, what in the world? How could this be? How can he be the Messiah? Everything I stand for is wrong. What is God going to do to me? Is he going to kill me? You have to remember, Saul's idea of God is that if you disagree with him, you should die. He had been killing people that he believed disobey, disobey God. And so he's thinking, is God going to now kill me? God's not planning to kill him. God's planning to use him. God looked at this guy and said, this guy's got high capacity. This guy's got some skills. If I can get him on my team, good things are going to happen. And so Jesus appears to one of his followers in Damascus, a man by the name of Ananias. And he says, Ananias, there's a guy named Saul. Saul of Tarsus, you might have heard of him. He's down at this house on Straight Street in Damascus. I want you to go. I want you to pray for him. I want you to heal him. And Ananias is like, Lord, I know all about this man. I know why he's coming here. I know what he's planning to do. I'm not going to him. He's dangerous. And the Lord said, go. He said, go. This man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. And Ananias is like, what? How unlikely is that? This is the guy that's destroying the church. And Jesus went on to say, I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. In other words, Ananias, Saul's got his coming too. Don't worry. Ananias obeys the Lord. He goes to Saul and he prays for him. And the rest, as they say, is history. Saul gets up, he's healed, he has his eyesight back. He's instantly baptized in the name of Jesus. He takes something to eat. And then he goes from Damascus to Arabia and from Arabia to the ends of the earth. And for the rest of his life, he invests the same amount of fervor, the same amount of energy, the same amount of passion and conviction and ambition that he had spent destroying the church. He now spends building up the church. And he's starting churches and he's developing leaders and he's writing letters to these newfound churches. And, and they're recording these letters and they're keeping these letters and they're making them into what becomes the New Testament. He takes three missionary journeys around the Roman Empire, leading countless people into faith in Christ, rise, raising up countless churches. And along the way, he was continually in prison, continually faces death. Listen to what he says just about a part of his journey. He says, five times I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. He was stoned so bad that they thought he was dead and they left him there for dead, but he wasn't dead. He actually went back into the city. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I have been constantly on the move. I have been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my fellow Jews, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, and in danger from false believers. I have labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst and often gone without food. I have been cold and naked. Besides everything else, I face the pressure of my concern for all the churches. In other words, Paul said, this, this road has not been easy. Turning to Jesus and serving Jesus and using all my skills to build up a church has not been easy. As a matter of fact, he says, after everything I've been through, the thing that weighs the heaviest on my heart is my concern for all the churches. I'll take the shipwrecks and the beatings and the whippings and the stonings. That's all good. But my, my concern for the church is what weighs on me the most. And for the last several years of Paul's life, he spends it in a prison. He ends up in a prison in Rome. And finally, right around his 60th birthday, one morning, Paul would be taken from his prison cell in Rome, and he would be walked to a Roman venue where there in front of spectators, he would be forced to kneel down and lay his head on a wooden stump where an executioner with an axe would separate his head 
from his body, ending the life of this great man of God, Saul or Paul. But Paul knew what he was getting into. And while his life was over, his influence was not. It not only still strings down 2,000 years later to us today, but it will expand into eternity. And toward the end of his life, writing from a prison cell in Rome, Paul would look back on his, his unlikely journey. And he would remember his time before Christ, and he would remember everything that happened after Christ, and he would say, I wouldn't change a thing. He says from this prison cell in Rome, circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, that's what I was, in regard to the law of Pharisee, as for zeal persecuting the church, as for righteousness based on the law, I considered myself faultless. But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider those things I lost garbage, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law like I used to think was how it worked, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection of the dead. Paul was a high-capacity guy. I mean, if he put his mind to something, he could do it. But he was running in the wrong direction. He was killing and persecuting God's people. And what I find amazing about the story is that God could have so easily just snuffed his life out. You're messing with my kids. Lights out for you. I mean, it could have just been easy, you know, for God to do. But that's not God's way. That wouldn't have demonstrated the power of the gospel to change a life. And it wouldn't have helped God's purposes on earth. It wouldn't have advanced the thing most central to God's heart, the church. Instead, God says to himself, I can see this guy's pretty effective. He's got some wiring that I could probably use on, on my side. And if I can get through to this guy, if I can convince him that my son really is who he says he is, there's no telling what kind of good he could do for my kingdom. And so God confronts Paul, and he convicts him, and he converts him. And this high-capacity man, not only had he, had he been going on the wrong side, not only had the wrong side lost a great mind and an amazing talent, but now, because of what God did in his life, the right side, God's kingdom, wins an amazing talent and an amazing gift in Paul. What a win. What a win. What a victory for God's kingdom. And so, what are the takeaways of Saul or Paul's story for us today? I mean, where does his story intersect with us living now some 2,000 years later? Let me share a few with you. I think one of the, the major takeaways that I see from this story is there is a God. I mean, skeptics take note. If you wonder if there's a God or not, how else do you explain how the number one enemy of the church becomes the number one advocate of the church and such a powerful one? We know Paul existed. We know he was an enemy of the church. Historical facts. We know what he did, what he wrote, and the testimony that he left. How do we explain that other than the fact that what he said was true, that the risen Jesus actually appeared to him, convicting him that he was going in the wrong direction and was so convicting, so powerful, that he changed his life and started heading the other direction. i got to say one of the takeaways is there is a God, and he is real, and he is involved in our lives. And a second takeaway I think we need to see is that God can save anyone. God will save anyone. God wants to save anyone. He wants to demonstrate his power in the worst of our stories. It doesn't matter how far we have fallen, what we have done, how we've blasphemed him, who we've hurt, how we've hurt them, how many times we've said no. It doesn't matter how hard we've been fighting against God, how hard we've been fighting against the church, against Jesus. That God still has a plan. God still has a purpose for my life. He still wants to redeem me. He still wants to use me. He still wants to empower me. He wants my life to be an amazing adventure, kind of like Paul's. He could save us from ourselves. He could make us the kind of people that we want to be through his power. And then we can know that we're investing in something bigger than ourselves, something that will stretch into eternity. And it won't always be easy, as we see from Paul's story, 
But like Paul, I think when we get to the end of our story, at least here on this planet, we would all be able to say it was worth it. I wouldn't change a thing. Anything I lost was garbage comparing to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ. Christ resurrected and the power of his resurrection. The third takeaway I would share is this. Paul's story is a calling to all high-capacity people. God has given high-capacity people gifts and talents and time and resources. And if you're wondering if you're a high-capacity person, you are. If you want to get something done, you can get it done. You have ambition. You've been able to accomplish things in your life, and you didn't think you were able to do it, but you were able to do it. And that was God's work in your life. He has made you a high-capacity person. I may not be just like Paul, but God has given me capacity to get things done. And so this Paul's story is a calling to all high-capacity people. What are you doing with your life? Those of you who have been running 180 degrees away from God, you're running as hard and fast as you can after, away from him, blaspheming him, living for everything but him. This is a calling on your life. What are you doing? What are you chasing after? And even those of us who are already committed to Christ, who are high-capacity people, the question is, what are you investing your life in? Where are you running? What, what is driving you? What ladder are you climbing? Is it just to build a business? Is it just to make money? Is it to find the best recreation or the greatest trip where I can get the best selfie? What direction are you running? What are you doing with your life that God has given you, with the gifts that God has given you, with the capacity God has given you? If God were to tap you on the shoulder or smack you upside the head on on your road of life right now, what would he want to reveal to you? about your life and about the direction of your life that maybe you think is the right direction, but he's like, no, we need to make a turn. At the risk of offending everyone present in the room, let me just say that if if you're spending your life building a business or just making money, that's great, but that's not enough. That if you are spending your life just investing in your kids and your family, that's great, but that's not enough. That if you are investing your life in just seeking fun and recreation, and, and, and the next great trip, that's great, but that's not enough. Paul's life shows us what is central to the heart of God, what pleases the heart of God, and the most worthwhile thing of investing our lives in is the kingdom of God. That is what will last. Nothing else will last outside of this, this world, but the kingdom of God in the hearts of men and women primarily the kingdom of God as expressed in the scope and the range of the local church. This is central to the heart of God. The church is the object of God's greatest affection. The church on earth is the hope of the world. And if you don't think so, if, you, if, you, if you're a high-capacity person here today, and you're like, you know, I just don't think that me investing my life, my resources, my talent, my gifts in the church is worthwhile just think of it this way. If, if this church here, New Day, were finally, uh, ultimately to disappear from our community, if we were to shut our doors like thousands of churches do every year, would that make a difference in your life? Would that make a difference in our community? Would that make a difference in our world? Now, maybe it wouldn't make a difference in your life, but there are countless people in our community in places like Rwanda and, and Peru and now in Puerto Rico would say, my life would be different if that church did not exist. My life would be darker. My life would have less hope as a result. But now think, what if every church in Parker shut down? Every Christian church. There are now no Christian churches in Parker or Denver. They're all gone. They all closed their doors. What happens to our community? What happens to your life? What happens to your family? What happens to your ambition? Now every church in America has shut down. No more churches No more local churches in all of America. What happens to our nation? If you don't think it's going to have an impact, I could take you to places in our world where this has happened. And those are dark, hopeless places. The local church is the hope of the world. More than business, more than recreational pursuits, even more than my family. The church is a city on a hill, a light shining in darkness, and it deserves the very best of what I have to offer, not my, not my leftovers. And so we need more Pauls. 
We need more people who are willing to say, I'm a high-capacity person, and I will give my best, use my talent, spend my time building up the church. And so let me just talk to the high-capacity people and say, you can do anything you set your mind to. You have influence in your place of business. If you wanted to start a Bible study or a prayer group in your business, you would be able to do that. You're a high-capacity person. If you wanted to start to view your business through the lens of how can I build God's kingdom into the lives of this business and the lives of the people that I work with, you would be able to do that. If you wanted to start to say, I'm going to use my time and my resources and my prayer toward investing in the people that I spend most of my time with outside of uh, my family and even outside of the church, and I'm going to start to get to know their issues, I'm going to pray for them, I'm going to look for opportunities to, to share a word of God for you would be able to do that. You're a high-capacity person. More than that, high-capacity people, they're, they're dedicated to this, the gathering, to come and be fed and refu refueled and, and, and get their priorities straight again. High-capacity people are committed to a small group, a community of people where I can bless and invest and be invested in and watch people grow as we grow together. These are things that last forever. High-capacity people look at their local church and say, you know what, I have things that I learned in business and in the world that I think can make this a better place, a better organization, more functional and, and better at mission. And I'm going to use those gifts toward making this organization more functional and more efficient and, and, and bearing more fruit. You know, New Day was built because a bunch of high-capacity people came together and said, we're going to build a healthy church. So I'm here to say, if you're one of those people and you are a high-capacity person, you are right now investing in the church, I'm here to tell you what you're doing and the resources you're using, you're not crazy. What you're doing matters. It matters in the lives of people right here in this room, right here in this community, and all over the world. You're not crazy for giving your best to God's kingdom. You know, 25 years ago, I had my own Damascus Road experience I was um, a, a stockbroker heading 180 degrees away from God, running after everything that I thought would bring joy and happiness and investing all my time and money in it, blaspheming and making fun of Christians every opportunity I got. And then I had my own Jesus experience, and it changed everything. And for the last 25 years, I have been investing my best in the church, and it has been so incredibly rewarding. And I'm standing before you saying, if you're not there yet, if you haven't yet turned to God, if you haven't yet said, you know what, the church is worthy of my best, would you join me? You know, we stand on the cusp of starting a new location in downtown Denver. Man, we need full engagement. We need some high capacity people who are willing to step up and say, here I am. I see some things that I can do around here. I see some things I could do in my community, in my workplace. I could be a better inviter. I could pray more. We want to see God do amazing things in our community, and our world needs it now more than ever. And so, again, if God were to come to you right now on the road of your life and tap you on the shoulder or smack you upside the head, what would he want to say to you? What would he say to you about the direction of your life? What would he say to you about how you're using your resources? And I'm just wondering, would you be willing to listen? The world needs more Pauls, unlikely leaders who turn their lives around and start heading in the right direction. Let's pray together. Father God, thank you for Paul, this man whom you didn't throw away, but you redeemed and used in ways that are still impacting us today. And God, I know in this room there are some amazing, high-capacity people. And first of all, you want to convince that you are real and that you are worthy. And I pray that you would break through, speak out loud if you need to, but convince each one of us, God, that you are real that you are love and that you are powerful. And Father God, we pray for every high-capacity person in this room that you would show us our place in your kingdom. Show us where we've been heading the wrong direction. Show us where we've been running in the wrong way, building our life on the wrong thing. And show us the direction you want us to go and how you want us to invest. And use us, God, to build something beautiful that will last not only for our lives, but for eternity. And we ask it in the priceless name of Jesus who makes it all possible. Amen.